Hi guys, just to let you know that I have a promo of another podcast that I would love for you to listen to playing at the very end of this episode. So please stay tuned until then. Hi m ms welcome back to another episode of Murder and More. As always, I am your host, Kira. Plan International UK suggests that 63% of women in Britain feel unsafe walking alone in the dark. It's an innate fear, one that's reinforced in childhood. Stranger danger dictates that all strangers are dangerous, and that you should never interact with strangers in the street. A child should never accept sweets off of a stranger, and you should never walk off with or get into a car with a stranger. The occurrence of the Moores murders, murders committed by Levi Belfield, and the abduction and murder of Sarah Payne in 2000, has made the stranger danger even more significant. While most of these warnings are aimed at children, adults should remain wary of strangers too, because while stranger abductions are extremely rare in the UK, they do happen. Rachel Moran was a 21-year-old cabaret and entertainment student at Hull College in 2002. She lived in Orchard Park, Kingston-upon-Hull, with her parents, Ray and Wanda Moran, and her brother John. The Morans were described as a close-knit family who were caring, down-to-earth and honest, with Ray and Wanda being described as only wanting the best for their children. Rachel was described as the apple of her mother's eye, who was a sociable but shy homebird and extremely keen to be close to her family. Wanda told the makers of the documentary Nightmare in Suburbia. Even when her best friend went to work abroad, she was horrified at the thought of joining her because she never wanted to go away. When Rachel moved in with her first serious boyfriend, Mark Shepard, whom she'd met at college in 2001, about a mile away from her parents in Saxe Court, Rachel ensured she visited them almost daily. John told the documentary, quote, It was nice to know that when she did move out, she didn't really move that far. It was really only three quarters of a mile, a mile down the road. End quote. In the weeks leading up to Christmas 2002, Rachel and Mark took a big step and brought two kittens into their family, Speedy Tomato and Batman. Wanda described Rachel as being fairly possessive and protective over the kittens, who Rachel saw more as her children than her pets. As the Christmas holidays approached, Rachel refused to allow the kittens to be left alone, so the couple devised a plan to ensure at least one of them was at the flat with them at all times. They decided that over Christmas, Rachel would stay in the flat with them, while Mark went to visit and spend Christmas with his mum. Then, on New Year's Eve, Mark would stay at the flat with the kittens, and Rachel would go out and celebrate with her brother, John. Mark was agreeable to this plan, as he didn't have much money at the time, so he wouldn't have been able to go out for New Year's Eve anyway. On the evening of Tuesday the 31st of December, 2002, Rachel and John headed out to a local pub to celebrate the new year coming in, a year for which Rachel had big plans. She wanted to be a chef. That was the thing she was most keen at, and she was going to go back to college in the new year and take up catering. John recalls that Rachel had a really good evening and even made some new friends. They had the countdown to midnight, saw in 2003, and stayed at the pub for another hour. Wanda recalls that the pair got home at about quarter past one and John, being fairly tipsy, went straight upstairs to get ready for bed. Rachel attempted to phone Mark back at the flat and was shocked when he didn't answer the phone. Confused, she tried his mobile and a friend answered, the sound of a party in the background. Rachel learned from this mutual friend that after she left for her parents' house that afternoon, 
Some friends had phoned John and invited him to a party they were attending later that evening. Rachel immediately grew concerned for the kitten's welfare and made the decision that she would go back home rather than staying at her parents' house. Wanda begged her daughter not to make the mile journey on her own. It was pitch black, cold and windy and Wanda, having had a few drinks that evening, was unable to drive her daughter home. But Rachel insisted and after a back and forth in Wanda's driveway, Rachel eventually left wearing a plum-coloured dress a jacket and trainers, promising Wanda she would ring her as soon as she got home. Half an hour passed, and Wanda didn't hear from her daughter. I tried her mobile, and it just kept ringing and ringing and ringing and cut out. So I tried ringing her house, but there was no reply, and then I tried again about ten minutes later, and I tried quite a lot of times then. The only thing I did think was she might have decided to go out walking and looking for Mark, in which case I did know that she wouldn't answer the phone because she'd expect me to say, why aren't you at home? After about two hours of trying to call Rachel and getting no response, Wanda finally decided to head to bed, seeing no point in staying up. However, when she awoke the next morning to find there was still no response from Rachel, Wanda grew concerned and explained to Ray and John what had transpired the previous evening. John tried to call both Rachel's house phone and mobile, however was unable to reach his sister, with her mobile saying it was unable to connect their call. After a few times of calling, John believed someone was in the flat as the landline was engaged. About five minutes later, Wanda called again and Mark answered the phone. Relieved, She asked if Rachel was there, and Mark revealed she wasn't, believing she was spending the night with them. He explained that he'd been at the party all night, and didn't get home until about 7am, before going straight to bed. John said, quote, As far as he was concerned, he was the last person to leave the flat the night before, and it was exactly as he'd left it, end quote. Wanda and John immediately went over to Rachel's flat to see for themselves. This confirmed that there was no sign of Rachel anywhere in the flat. Mark didn't seem too concerned, stating that Rachel could be anywhere, but Wanda and John were extremely concerned for her safety and went to the Priory Police Station to report Rachel as a missing person. As this was totally out of character for Rachel to just disappear and she'd been walking alone in the pitch black, Late at night, police were immediately concerned and launched a full-scale missing person inquiry, with over 40 officers assigned to the investigation. Police looked at who Rachel was last with and places she may have been, interviewed Mark to get a full picture of the couple's relationship, and Rachel's family gave witness statements to help police learn as much information as they could about who Rachel was. Wanda recalled seeing a man walk past the house while her and Rachel were in the driveway discussing her walking home alone, and police were keen to identify the man. Meanwhile, they were immediately concerned by Mark's behaviour, as he didn't seem overly worried by his girlfriend's disappearance, and needed to figure out if he had any involvement in it. Very quickly, they eliminated Mark from their investigation, They had many witnesses from the party to corroborate that Mark had stayed there until roughly 6am and surveillance teams following his movements observed nothing suspicious. Police had no further leads to go on. None of Rachel's clothes were missing and her bank account and mobile hadn't been used since she disappeared, which ruled out her running away on her own accord. Detectives explored every avenue to search for even the smallest of clues and their hard work eventually paid off. Having gathered CCTV from a six-mile radius around the route Rachel should have taken home, they discovered CCTV footage of Rachel walking past a shop, corroborating Wanda's account of the night. This then enabled police to start a proper search for Rachel around the area she was seen on the tape, using every resource they had, helicopters, dogs, horses, and underwater search teams. On Saturday the 11th of January, Humberside's police diving team began search in the Balmston Drain, a local canal that was full of household rubbish. 
They went over the canal several times, initially skimming the surface and subsequently removing items and digging a bit deeper. Within just hours of the start of the search, divers found a shoe that matched the description of the shoes Rachel was wearing when she disappeared. Just the following day, more vital evidence was discovered when divers found a lady's handbag that contained a mobile phone, makeup, hair clips, and most importantly of all, a passport belonging to Rachel Moran. Whilst this gave a much more cynical feel to the investigation, Wanda remained hopeful that her daughter hadn't met with foul play that night. I didn't think for a second that anyone had thrown her in the water, but I just thought she must have been so distressed that night that she'd gone to the drain and fallen in it, not necessarily thrown herself in, but slipped in the dark, and I just felt totally guilty that maybe I could have done something to stop her doing that, forced her back into the house. Believing Rachel was dead, police created a reconstruction of the night she disappeared, using a police officer that looked a lot like Rachel, hoping it would jog memories of potential witnesses, and hoping the mysterious man who walked past Wanda's house that night would come forward. They had the officer wear similar clothes to the clothes Rachel was wearing that night, and she walked the route Rachel would have taken to get back to her flat. The reconstruction garnered a good response, with several witnesses coming forward. However, because it had been New Year's Eve, and most of them had been drinking, they weren't the most reliable of witnesses. Despite this, the reconstruction did lead police to gathering CCTV from a school near Rachel's flat. The CCTV was of extremely poor quality, but detectives believed that the shadowy figure seen on the tape was Rachel. If it was her, she would have been just 150 metres from the safety of her flat. This CCTV also led police to believe that Rachel hadn't taken the route home they thought she had, which would have been well lit. Instead, they believed that Rachel had walked a route that would have been extremely dark, making her much more vulnerable. As they continued to watch the tape, they noticed another shadowy figure, not far behind Rachel which opened up a whole new investigative avenue. Rachel's disappearance could have been caused by a complete stranger. Today's episode is sponsored in part by Podcorn. Podcorn is one of the easiest ways to monetize your podcast whether you're big or small. Podcorn is a marketplace connecting podcasters with amazing sponsorship opportunities, such as host red ads, interview segments, topical discussions and more. With Podcorn, there is no middleman and you retain full creative freedom. You set your own rates and collaborate with brands directly with no exclusivities. I love Podcorn and I can guarantee that you will too. Sign up today at podcorn.com to begin monetizing your podcast. That's podcorn.com, P-O-D-C-O-R-N.com. Stranger abductions are rare, but statistics state that 99% of the time, the victim is found within one mile of where they were abducted. This led the detective in charge of the investigation, Detective Superintendent Paul Davison, to devise an unprecedented operation that would require over 100 officers to attend to every house within a mile and a half radius of where they believe Rachel had been abducted and attempt to search the entire house. Many officers disagreed with this operation which would have cost thousands of pounds and required the goodwill and cooperation of residents. But D.S. Davison wasn't deterred and hoped that the high-profile search would either lead to the discovery of Rachel's body or cause the killer to dump her body in a public area. D.S. Davison invited news cameras to the initial searches, 
which began on Tuesday the 28th of January 2003, to show the public what they were doing and why. Each search team consisted of two police officers and a search specialist, and by lunchtime, dozens of houses had been searched. Sometime that afternoon, D.S. Davison received a call from the incident room, telling him they had an upset officer on the phone. His heart sank, believing it was going to be an officer who'd had a bad experience with a resident and didn't want to take part in the operation any further. Instead, however, it was quite the opposite. On the other end of the phone was PC Steve Dennison, who informed DS Davison that he had been searching flats about 300 yards from Rachel's flat. He just searched number 19 Nash Court, a dingy, squalid flat belonging to Michael Little. Michael was at the flat with a friend, Mark Fuller, and both had clearly seen the news, knowing why the officers were there and happily showing them round the flat. Their cooperation ceased, however, when PC Dennison asked to search the locked bin cupboard that each flat had. PC Dennison asked Michael for the keys to the cupboard, who initially told him they were at his mother's house. As PC Dennison pressed further, refusing to leave without searching the cupboard, Michael finally gave him the key to not only the cupboard, but to solve in this investigation. Inside the tiny, three foot by three foot cupboard was a pile of rubbish, carpet, boxes and bin bags full of household waste. As they removed items from the piles, the second officer present stopped dead in his tracks. P.C. Dennison followed the officer's eyes, and they were both now looking at a leg sticking up through the piles. There, at the back of the small bin cupboard, officers found the fully clothed body of Rachel Moran. They immediately went back into the flat and arrested the two men on suspicion of murder. While Mark was shocked and confused, Michael himself almost seemed relieved informing officers that Mark knew nothing of it. The two officers waited with Michael and Mark while assistants came to transport the two back to the police station. The first car arrived and the second officer took Mark, leaving PC Dennison alone with Michael Little, waiting for the second car to arrive. As he waited, Michael began to talk. He was in a position, I presume, where he felt he needed to get it off his chest as to what had happened. He bottled it up for a month and now he'd been caught. He clearly wanted to disclose information to me. PC Dennison reminded Michael of his rights and recorded his confession in his notebook. These are quotes. I'm so glad you found her. I wanted to tell someone for ages. It's such a weight off my chest. I saw the police stuff on the news and just hoped they came here. I've not told anybody else, nobody knows. He said, I can't be a normal person doing this, I must be evil or something. I saw her that night walking alone, so I went over and spoke to her. She came back here for a drink and we chatted for a while, but ended up arguing. I think I walked out of the room or something, and when I came back, she'd gone to the kitchen and was stood at the side with her back to me. When I went near her, she turned around and I saw a small knife in her hand. She slashed out at me and cut me on my arm. I grabbed the knife and just stabbed her. Michael Little was just 22 years old at the time of Rachel's murder and was described as being a grossly overweight man who suffered from depression, was unemployed and spent most of the time in his flat where he would regularly smoke weed, watch porn and drink. Michael's friends revealed to police that he openly fantasised about having relationships with women. However, none of them believed he actually had a girlfriend, as he'd never had the confidence to speak to a woman when they were out. At the time of Rachel's disappearance, friends informed police that Michael's imaginary girlfriend was blonde, slim and over six feet tall, a description that also fit Rachel Moran. Police believed that with Rachel living nearby, Michael would watch her walk past his flat and began to fantasise about her. On New Year's Eve, Michael went out to celebrate with a friend. While they were out, he got rejected by a woman and his friend eventually ended up going off with her, which would have probably upset Michael. 
He then bumped into another friend who invited him to a party, where he stayed until about midnight. Police believe he then decided to walk home, probably still angry about being rejected earlier that evening. Detectives traced the route Michael would have taken to get home, and were shocked when they learned it took him right past Wanda's house. Probably at the same time, Wanda and Rachel were outside. Police believed Michael was the passerby they'd been so desperate to identify, and were convinced that he'd overheard Rachel say she was going to walk home alone, and believed this was his chance to follow her. To confirm their suspicions, police re-watched the initial CCTV they found of Rachel walking past the shop, and sure enough, three minutes before Rachel walked past, there was Michael Little. Knowing that on the second CCTV from the school showed a man walk in behind Rachel, police believed Michael had hidden and waited for Rachel to be in front of him, and then followed her, which showed a degree of premeditation. Rachel's post-mortem revealed that her cause of death was severe, multiple stab wounds to her back, with one or two being so forceful that they came through to her front. Rachel had been stabbed in the back, head and neck 27 times, and presented with no defensive wounds, which discredited Michael's account of self-defence. Dried mud on the back of Rachel's legs suggested that she had been dragged across the grass into Michael's flat, possibly with his hand over her mouth to stop her screaming. To further disprove Michael's confession, analysis of blood spatter revealed that Rachel had been murdered in Michael's hallway and not in the kitchen, as he'd claimed. Police believed that Michael may have tried to befriend Rachel that night as they were walking home, and her family insisted she'd have had none of it. With this being the second rejection of the night, Police believed it pushed him over the edge, and he kidnapped her, took her back to his flat, where he murdered and raped her, and wrapped her in a duvet in the fetal position, before putting her in the bin cupboard. On the 31st of January 2003, Michael was charged with Rachel's murder. Mark Fuller was released from custody, with no proof he had any involvement. Despite confessing, Michael pleaded not guilty to Rachel's murder and his three-week trial began on the 30th of October 2003 at Hull Crown Court, where he pinned the murder on Mark, claiming that Mark had walked in on him and Rachel having sex, and had killed her in a jealous rage. Despite his bizarre claims, after eight and a half hours of deliberation, the jury found the emotionless Michael Little guilty of the murder of Rachel Moran. In a statement read out in court, Wanda said, I no longer walk anywhere, due to my fear of bumping into people who may stop and talk to me about Rachel. I cannot return to places I previously visited with Rachel. I cannot use my knives, as it has become something which triggers painful comparisons. I am a physical wreck, I do not sleep properly, and I do not eat properly. The loss of Rachel has severely traumatised my family. Life will never be the same again. We have not just lost Rachel, but lost part of each of her. Michael Little was sentenced to life in prison, with a minimum term of 25 years. Stranger abductions are rare, happening only a few times a year. Unfortunately, Rachel Moran's murder was one of these, but also was solely a matter of coincidence. If Rachel had left her mum's even a few minutes earlier, or later, Michael Little would have missed her and wouldn't have had a clue that she was walking alone. As a result of that complete coincidence, Rachel's family and friends will forever grieve the loss. In a 2013 interview with Whole Daily Mail, Wanda said, In some ways it seems like yesterday, and in others, it seems like forever. When I get irrational, I think, was it really her? Knowing it was, but I can't remember every minute of it. I remember from when she first left the house, feeling something bad had happened. I know there was no reason for her to not get in touch. Even from that moment, I knew she was not coming back. She went on to tell them. I think she would definitely have had children. She was good with children and good at cooking. When she was younger, she said she wanted to be a vet, 
Later, she took a job at a creche and she loved looking after the babies. In a way, she was really naive. She was allowed to remain a child. She was allowed to remain dependent on us, even though she was 21. She was the baby. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to head over to Apple Podcasts to leave a rating and review and Patreon to consider becoming a patron of Murder and More. As a patron, for just for just $2 a month, you get access to episodes early and ad-free and you get a sticker sent to you. The link to my Patreon can be found in my show notes. To interact with us, you can follow us on Twitter and Tumblr at Murder and More, Instagram at Murder and More Pod, and Facebook at Murder and More Podcast. To view the sources and pictures for this episode, head over to www.murderandmorepodcast.wordpress.com. Have an amazing few weeks, stay safe, and I'll see you all in two weeks for another episode. Hello, this is Eric Carter Landine, the host and producer of True Consequences, a true crime and mystery podcast with stories based in New Mexico and the American Desert Southwest. We'll uncover cases such as the Toy Box Killer, one of the worst serial rapists and suspected serial killers in New Mexico's history. We will also discuss mysteries such as alien sightings, as well as hauntings and other weird things that happen in this area of the country. I hope you'll give me a chance and listen to True Consequences. I think you might enjoy it. You can find us wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts.